Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday afternoon if you're on the West Coast, mid afternoon if you're on the East Coast of the US. And let's see, I believe it's 8 or 9 p.m. in the UK, where we're, our guest is going to be joining us from. Maybe even it's a Friday morning in Australia, if you're listening from there. But thrilled to have all of you with us. Thank you so much for joining us for another SubConnect Live on Thursday at this time. Um, we have a great guest today, really an, an OG, one of the originals in um, the stand-up pedal world, specifically inflatables today. I'm um, excited to talk about that, but just a couple things. Remembering this is live, but we also record it. It's available immediately on SubConnect's IGTV, and then later it will be on their YouTube. Um, we do have a Facebook group too, so if there's any follow up, but you're welcome to ask questions here also. Um, hashtag SubConnect Live Discussions is the um, Facebook group. Love you to join us there also if you have any questions. So thanks again for being here. Um, we're going to be talking to John Hibbard. CEO and co-founder of Red Paddle Company. Um, he's in the UK, so this is really, he's being a good sport because it's quite late at night there that, where he's going to be joining us from. I think he's originally from there. We'll have to ask him that amongst other things. But truly one of the, if not the iconic brand in the ice up inflatable world. So excited to talk to him today. Um, lucky en enough to have met him before about three years ago Thank in you Canada. So Great to see you, John. You too. Thank you for staying up um, this evening. <laughs> That's right. You. It's about nine, nine o'clock here. so uh, not Nine o'clock. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So good for the UK and, and, um, and uh, European people to be able to hear too. But sorry, it's close to bedtime. I don't know about you. I'm getting older. I go to bed pretty early these days. <laughs> but great to talk with you and so much to talk about. Um, Kind of would love to start with you and your story because um, you weren't just a windsurfer, um, you were a champion windsurfer. And it's interesting to me how many people in the stand-up paddle world come from that. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a bit of a progression, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah. it, for, for me, it was a progression partly due to injury um, mm. and also partly due to, I guess, uh, kind of entrepreneurial business sort of uh, aspirations and actually and unless you're unless you're a world champion which i wasn't uh at windsurfing then you, you have to find ways to to make it work and I'm, i was professional for eight or nine years back in the in the, in the uh, first decade of the 2000s and uh yeah you kind of have to run yourself as a bit of a promotional machine i guess and uh marketing and and, and media and, and everything else sort of something you have to learn on yeah. the job really so for me it was just transferring those skills from uh, or that, and actually a passion for that sort of thing mm -hmm. from marketing yourself and, and your sponsors to marketing or creating, creating a brand and a, and a company. So it was a kind of, yeah, kind of easy transition almost. Yeah. You had training, but you've yeah. gone a little different direction. Most people I've spoken to who came from the windsurfing world had existing companies. So they were mm -hmm. already building a large board, had international distribution and still some of those com companies, they were making hard boards um, but you really went a different direction and got right into the inflatable world. Something yeah, all different and started a new company. Yeah, I, I think because, so I love windsurfing. Windsurfing is an amazing sport. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to windsurf in some amazing locations and some amazing conditions. Um, but I think probably one thing I missed and potentially because, it, because I was competing, you know, it's so focused on competing that I had friends in windsurfing, but I didn't windsurf with them, really. I traveled with them and I would compete at events with them. But when you're on the off season or when you're, when you're training, you wouldn't spend too much time with them. Or at least I wouldn't, because I didn't want to show them what I was working on or, or you know, <laughs> they're, they're just forever competitive, basically. So paddleboarding for me was, although when I started, I started racing. I did the very, the very early uh, Waterman Tour or APP as it is now events, uh, the Sup World Cup in Hamburg and those kind of racing events. I did this, I think it was the second year of the Battle of the Paddle. Um, so I was, I was very involved in the, in the competing side as well, but it's not so much a technique driven thing. It was more, you know, racing obviously is, is a fitness and endurance thing. So I, I enjoyed paddleboarding because it was a social thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing that really, really hit me very early on was that I could take my friends and family paddleboarding and there was no kind of competition involved really. Um, you know, I'd sprint, sprint up, you know, across the, the bay or something, but that was it. Um, so for me, it, it, it just, it, it was different to Winsurfing. It wasn't, it wasn't so much about competition. It was about the kind of social aspect. So that's, and then I, and then that's what led me to make or, or, or start in paddleboard brand that was inflatable because 
all of my friends and my family loved going, coming with me, but nobody wanted to buy a board. Uh, and I don't know if this was a European thing or a British thing, but they were heavy, 12 to 6, you know, lumps, mm. glass fibre. They would, they no one ever to store them. Heavy, no one to store them. No, you know, we're, we're not like you guys in the US with big trucks, you know, which I would, you know, always go, go to the US. <laughs> like, oh, that's a big truck. But I couldn't drive <laughs> a big truck down the road to my house. It wouldn't fit. Um, and so most of my friends and family didn't want to buy the boards because they just couldn't store them, transport them. So that's really where... I guess the inflatable thing came from. Now we didn't invent it, obviously. It was already it was already a thing, but it wasn't a very good thing. So I thought, well, we could probably make it better, um, and that's really what what really sparked my, I suppose, um, entrepreneurial element of, of me. But also the fact that through windsurfing, you get involved in product design, product development. So mm-hmm. I, I just looked at what we had and thought, I'm pretty sure we can make this better. Um, and so I ended up working with my then sales sponsor, who were very expert in, in building textile product. Good. So not, not glass fiber, not composite, not, not carbon product, but sails, you know, materials. And obviously that's really what an pad, inflatable paddleboard is. It's, it's a, a material textile based uh, product, obviously that's, that's glued and stitched. Um, and so kind of similar to a sail. And actually you create shape in a board very much how you create shape in a sail. So we just took this kind of like a vertical aerofoil and put it flat on the ground. Thought, right, how can we create rocker and, and curve in the board? And we use a similar sort of thinking and, and mindset. So I think we were probably kind of a little bit further on the road where everyone else was thinking about mowing foam and glassing and, and, and uh, composite. We were thinking about textile. So we were already halfway there. Well, you, you said you weren't the very first, but I think of you as, as one of the first. You were one of the first. 2008 yeah, sure. was early, yes. especially from our North American perspective. We were a little late to the game on picking up on the inflatable thing. But finally... Oh my gosh, this year. It's crazy. Yeah. I've never seen so many in Dana Point Harbor here. Yeah. But well, you also, just your innovations and your thinking and um, just what you have done in terms of furthering the game for everyone, because of course, you know, there has been a lot of copying of things that you have mm-hmm. done well because of you're so focused on R&D from early um, has been amazing. So talk about that, those early processes of, of um, yeah, well, I, th- I actually think the, U- the U.S. market, uh, U.S. and Canadian market, were actually quite early. We were inflatable balls. They got in, but they got out almost immediately because it was just, whoa, this is actually a really, this, this sucks, you know, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and, it, and it kind of never went anywhere. Whereas I, maybe we were, I wasn't going to accept that. I thought, you know, come on, we must going to make it better. So really, really, it was a case of getting, getting some made initially or making some initially and go, yeah, these suck. Uh, right, how can we make these better? And so understanding, that's why I go back to that textile thing, and understanding how in, when you laminate two sheets together, you know, if, if, they're different, if they're different ply material, you can get different curves to, to be created. So we just, we just start playing around with it. And um, yeah, I just really just desperately wanted to find a way to make them stiffer, for example, or, or take higher pressure. And then therefore, mm-hmm. and it, one thing just led to another, to another, to another. You know, it was you know, obviously where we're at now is a journey. The first thing I wanted to do was just make, was to make them stiff. So that was the first thing we worked on. And then I thought, well, I'm really tired of pumping this thing up. You know, I'd, I would go into shops actually and go, yes, it was an amazing thing. It's, it's cool paddleboarding. So in the UK, we were, we, were, we were very much the first people to show the sport. And I would go in and go, yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's, you stand on the board and you paddle. Um, oh, and by the way, you pump it up as well. So people were like, what? No. You, so I stand on it and I'm paddle and then I pump it up as well. And I was like, yeah, yeah, look, I'll show you. And I'd pump the board up and I was so tired after like five minutes of pumping up, I couldn't, could barely speak. I got extremely fit actually <laughs> just pumping up boards. So I thought, right, I've got to solve that issue. I need to get a better, uh, better pump. So one thing just led to another. Mm-hmm. So that's, where, that's really, and I think that's probably in all um, innovation, that is how it works, isn't it? You, know, you come up with one idea, you can then Im- improve on, on that idea. So yeah, we've, you know, stiffening systems, uh, material technologies, a lot of what you see around now, you know, it is something that we were involved in from the early days. Um, obviously, durability is a massive thing. Longevity of the product, yeah. so it makes it last. The pumps, obviously, making a board that can pump up easily, store easy. Um, yeah, it's it's an, been an amazing journey, actually. And yeah, sure, people have copied us, but that's kind of it's kind of the way of the world, isn't it? It's you know, it's uh, you get a bit of first mover advantage, but you and there's a bit of kind of being flat, flattered by people copying you. But I think it's it's fine. You need competition. Actually, when we started. It was very hard to get traction in the market. There wasn't enough people, one paddling, there wasn't enough offer of, of product. And what we needed was competition. And, you know, a race isn't a race without a competitor. So I'm, I'm always, I'm all for competitors. That's great. That's kind of what makes them the competitive nature in you. 
come yeah. out and makes you want to do better. So, yeah, well, 12, 12 years in and you have absolutely established yourself as the top, you know, the quality top brand. And you have, let's talk a little bit about the boards. There's such a range and pro other products too. Um, in fact, I did a, a little uh, Zoom chat about expeditioning and somebody asked about your new board and we weren't able to, I don't know if it's yeah. new, but there's an expedition specific package, I think. Be sure to mention that one because we had some yeah. questions about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the range, the range is, is uh, diverse, but it's actually the, the bulk of, of what we sell. It's actually still, what I would plus is all round which I think is brilliant because that just means there's more people coming to the sport. They're new. There's new people coming to the sport. We always say it's the bicycle of the water. You know, you're getting a board that you can kind of do everything yeah. on. You can surf on it. You can paddle up the river. You can, you know, cross the bay on it and get the kids on the front dog on the front. So the all round boards are, are by far the, our biggest sellers. But what, what we're seeing emerging is this touring thing. So the thing about expedition is the touring sector. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one thing that, I was very keen on in the early days of, of paddleboarding and particularly starting red was that we shouldn't, we shouldn't try and carry on to this kind of this point of elite performance because kind of windsurfing did that and it just went, it, which is brilliant if you're part of it and you had the mm -hmm. money and time to spend on it, but eventually you would just alienate pretty much everybody else because you were just looking for the, the most radical conditions, most radical equipment. Inflatable boards have, have kept the sport grounded. I think if we'd left it to composite, we would all be right. Or we wouldn't be, wouldn't be any of us doing it, but we'd all be riding 24 inch wide <laughs> racing boards or surfing boards that barely floated us. But paddleboard, the playable boards, just for their very nature, even despite all the innovation, are, are kind of set, the certain set things you can, you can, can and can't do with them. So, but touring is one thing they really lend themselves to. So we're seeing this really emerging sort of trend of people wanting to, to, to maybe not go that far. When, we, when I say expedition and adventuring, it doesn't have to be hundreds no. of miles it could be five miles it'd be three miles but it's going from a to b and maybe back to a but maybe not you know maybe getting a lift back from b uh and so we, we're really trying to focus on making those boards better for that so how we have our v-hull voyager board which is you know again using our understanding of rocker curves and how we can build it into the board we have a lovely v that gives breaks that surface tension gets the glide going but it's it, it tapers out into a nice flat section on, on in the midpoint in the back so the board's still very stable but still very fast so um, it's things like that where we're, we're trying to develop for the every, every man, every person. Um, yeah, and I do uh, think that's brilliant because I live in a surf culture area mm -hmm. and definitely people have that vision still of the surfboard style. But to me, the touring style is the best board. Yeah. I'd love to see everybody start on it because yes. once you get going, if you love it, you do want to get some glides, some bang for your buck for every effort that you put in. So yeah. that's... And that has been for some who are get into it. Well, would I want an inflatable? Because it doesn't have as much of that. But here you've created with, yeah. you know, a V hull, yeah. you know, something to counter that, that, that helps with the, the glide. You yeah, also absolutely. have all kinds of, and I think some people are finally catching on, little things do count. And you oh, have yeah. all kinds of little innovations and well thought out placements of, of attachments and, you know, the bungees and the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, and, and I think probably that comes from being paddleboarders. And I think that's where, you know, the barriers to entry are fairly low to be an inflatable brand. We all know that, you know, you, if you wanted to set up a brand with your name stamped on it, it, it wouldn't take you very long to find someone to make you some, something, mm -hmm. put, put a logo on it. So I think a lot of what we see as brands or companies in, in inflatable side of sport aren't really paddlers. You know, they're just, they're jumping on a trend. They're buying, mm -hmm. it's very much rinse and repeat products. If you stripped all the graphics off them, they're all basically the same, same construction, same materials. Um, they may or may not be good at marketing. So you, so you might favor one over the other, but what, we're a bit different. You know, we, we are making, we're making boards that we want to use. So everyone in the company, you know, there's 30 plus people working at Red Paddle Co. Now we all paddle board, oh. we, we all get out of the water. And so we, so we kind of do our own development and we listen to the customers as well because they go, oh, we're really good if it did this, good idea. Let's, let's make something that, that works like that. So we try and, you know, you have to be careful when the innovation, you don't go too quickly, too fast, because that's where you end up with problems. But yeah, there's, there's things like our stiffening systems, the way our handles are, the twin mm. bin systems, those sort of things that I think are, are a testament to the fact that we paddle um, and they're not just copied from, from anybody, somebody else. So yeah, there's lots of small bits, small features um, on the boards. And the pump you mentioned, but your double chamber pump is mm. all that makes all the difference. 
<laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, who wants to be pumping up? You know, you want to you want to be paddling. Um, and yeah, sure, you can buy twelve volt pumps. But if anyone who's ever bought one, they don't last that long. You know, uh, and actually, the best thing to do before you're doing sport is warming up. So actually, pumping up is a great warm up. But let's not make it too strenuous. So yeah, yeah, the double chamber pump. You know, it's simple physics, isn't it? You just get a lot more uh, air in much quicker, um, yeah. and then and then you switch the gears to make it easy to get the high pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned the all around are being most popular. Somebody just said they have the ten six. Is that the mm. still the size that yeah, ten is six, most popular? Right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think there's there's a, there's a real value in uh, longevity of, of 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 the name of the product, uh, so people can trust it. That, you know, red palico boards hold their value because because I think they're so respected. As, we don't go changing shapes every year, you know, just for innovation for innovation's sake. We only change it if we really need to change it. So. Yeah, 10 is by far our bestseller. I do think that's brilliant. The name, Red, where does that come from? Yeah, <laughs> I ask that question all the time. Uh, it, it's not a very <laughs> good story, good. really. <laughs> yeah, well, I just, I knew I wanted to start this paddleboard brand. I'd already, actually already done a few of the designs and, 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 and a little bit of the material technology. And I, I just decided I wanted to call it Paddle Company, Paddle Co, something like that. But I hadn't done that first word. And I had a friend of mine who helped me. Uh, in the early days, doing some of the graphic design, and I was sitting in his studio. He he lives on the on the north coast of of Devon, the county where I live. We live here in, in the UK, and um, his, he lives on the, on a hilltop overlooking a really nice surf beach. Uh, he's got a little cabin in his garden, um, and we were we were drawing up one day all the, all these kind of stupid names, uh, and they were rubbish. They were all awful. And then <laughs> the sun went. The sun was going down, and and the sky just went bright pink, but bright red. And yeah. I just flippantly said, "Just call it red." Red Paddle Company, Red Paddle Co. And he drew it out on his iPad. And I was like, that's it. Perfect. Brilliant. So it was like, it. it was kind of, <laughs> it was that slightly out of desperation, but it kind of fitted, you know. And, oh, uh, I think that's, yeah, destiny. And, I, and, yeah. and then someone told me that red was the most winningest color. I don't know if that's true. But I was like, well, yeah, that, that, that there works. You go. <laughs> this was before we were winning anything. But uh, yeah, so that's where it really came from. Yeah. My, vis my vision was uh, very much that, that red was his parent that was the brand and we were going to we were going to get really busy doing red paddle company red whatever you know red surf just the list went on in my head we just got so busy doing paddle boards that we never really progressed past that but um we have red original now which is our accessory range which is going great guns okay. um but uh, yeah that's kind of as far as we've got so far but yeah. that's cool what I'm types of things do you have in your accessory range so so yeah red red original is uh partly it started off as being sort of paddleboard accessories so with deck bags um and your board sleeves to put your board in to protect them um but one of the major products we are doing is and it has probably hasn't really hit the u.s i don't think yet but is the is the kind of concept of changing robes so getting changed at the beach mm. um particularly in colder weather so we have a thing called a pro change jacket which is a waterproof outer uh and a kind of um a fleece inner um so it keeps you really warm and dry we perfectly i would imagine someone like oregon or Northern California, where you know, yeah, on the coast, nice. cold days or cold mornings. So that they, those are just are flying, um, and I, I I love the US guys to pick up on that because I think it's a fantastic yeah. product. It's a real well, thing. All, in, all you, along the West Coast, the Pacific Ocean's mm. cold, so even though yeah, our yeah. air isn't always that yeah. cold, we're cold yeah. when we get out of the water after yeah. you know surfing and such. Oh, that's great! So, and two people say they love your beanies. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> That's under that probably. People that always want a beanie. We'd actually make one, but uh, we do. We had some promotional. Oh, they want them. Okay. Well, we've, we had some promotional <laughs> ones we put out. And people go, "Oh, we love those," and, and we've like I don't know, we made a handful of them. But uh, yeah, everyone always wants a uh, wants a beanie. But oh, uh, that's funny. Well, I guess you need to. You're right. I didn't read go. very carefully. Yeah. Do you have beanies? Yeah. I want no. a red paddle beanie. Well, we did. Okay. Uh, we did. Uh, well, I should probably find some. We probably still got some in a box somewhere. But uh, yeah, we should. Uh, we should make some. <laughs> there you go. Oh, we should. I should have known that ahead of time. And, Got you to give some as prizes, right? Throw yeah, them yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. So um, where do you see kind of the market going? I mean, how was – it's been a very, very unusual year. <laughs> um, yeah. March and well, April, we thought things were going to be crashing yeah. down. And then what yeah, a switch yeah. around – was it around May or June for you yeah. guys in the UK? Yeah. 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 So talk well, about the industry and where you see it going. Yeah, so if we rewind back to the beginning, so pre-red pre, pre -red, you know, I, I was competing, I was racing, I was surfing, and, and I, was, I was for a while there thinking, this is, this is the way this sport's going to go. This is going to be a competitive-driven sport. You know, I was setting up races in the UK. I had visions that all, like, all the triathletes and the Ironmen type of, type of competitors would get involved, and we'd be racing, yes. and it'd be huge race events. Obviously, I went to the, the second Battle of the Powder, and I thought, yeah, this is the way it's going to go. And, and, you know, I'd go home with all this sort of energy from these races, and, I, and, it, and it wasn't happening. 
as I said earlier, I then caught on to this kind of like, actually, it's the mass market thing uh, and it, or, the, or the mass consumer um, and it's a recreational activity rather than being a dedicated hardcore sport and I and that, and that I've stuck to that I really believe that and this year has been testing to that because th with this whole social distancing and people being able to not being able to do maybe team sports or, or, or close quarter sports paddleboarding just lends itself perfectly to that so I think people have realized that there's a whole load of people now have realized actually this is a really good fun thing to do it's uh, I can do it anywhere. I can do it in different locations, different, you know, I don't have to be an expert in it. So I think there's just, it's going to continue to go, to, to rise. And it's, it needs stimulus. And the COVID has been almost a stimulus to, to give it that second, second, yeah. second push. Mm -hmm. I mentioned already about cycling. You know, I really feel like it's uh, very similar to the way that cycling has developed over the years. Um, in the UK, we had London 2012 Olympics. And that's the most recent kind of stimulus I can imagine for cycling outside of COVID, obviously, because that's also been good for cycling. But we, we started to win lots of Team GB. We're winning lots of medals in cycling. And cycling in the UK suddenly got this a, a wave of new supporters because it, there was promotion around it. Uh, and, and cycling just took off again, you know, it, and it became very mainstream. Um, and I think paddleboarding is that. It just These things just need stimulus. You need exposure. And, yeah. and paddleboarding's had that exposure this, this summer because mm -hmm. it's one of the best things to do socially distanced but the best thing to do when you know, the lockdown's eased and i think that'll continue on and people are getting so much from it you know we're what we're seeing in europe and maybe you're seeing it as well is that people are extending their paddle season now so where maybe a year ago or two years ago it was very much a summer thing and there, yeah there's a few hardcore guys like you and me and everyone else going out in the winter because so what it's cold we just paddle um but I, we see you know, we have a we have a, a fantastic uh, board owners group for red paddle co on facebook run by mm -hmm. our customers not by us what we're seeing on there is people kind of continuing on through the summer, through the winter. Um, and okay, we don't get particularly harsh winters. It's, you know, in the UK, it's a bit wet and cold, but it's not you know, icy or anything really. But people are continuing on. So I really feel people have just latched onto this and going to keep going mm -hmm. with it. Um, so I just see, yeah, from an industry point of view, from what we're doing is just trying to keep supplying product to the people that want to go out and enjoy it for for the experience not the technique so it's not about being the fastest it's not about being turning the tightest on the wave it's about having the best experience experience driven uh, sport is how i see paddleboarding so yeah, yeah. i think it's, the, the future is brilliant for for not only the industry but also also everyone getting involved yeah and it really is i mean i love the analogy always of the bicycle of the water because mm. it's the most versatile watercraft there's yeah. ever been yeah and it is we know over 90% recreational, and that is what most people are about. Yep. But that does often lead into these others. And I just have to mention, because I do have a red race board, and I have taken it numerous places in the world yep. and done well on it. And it, and it was yep. such a game changer to be able to fly to an island, because I'm not a pro, and I'm not sponsored to get paid to go there, but to be able to make it happen. Yep. Um, so. The, the, you have taken off in these different directions that I think people really are, I see them, if they really get crazy into it, like you and I, <laughs> and we try all the different things. Along yep. those lines, somebody's asking if you're going to do a blow up foil or wing board. Uh, Toby, yeah. Uh, not at the moment, actually, <laughs> because um, it is, uh, again, I'll go back to that mass market thing, you know. It's not. We, it, it's, it's not really where we, we are at the moment. It might be something that happens, but we are, we're so focused on on making sure the sport doesn't disappear up that pinnacle, you know, it, yeah. it, it yep. is, is for everybody. You know, I really, I really feel like that. I really feel like looking after mm -hmm. the sport and looking after the recreation and not just disappearing off onto is fun, but you're back, but actually maybe mm -hmm. for everyone else it's not. So, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it we want to progress the, the every man's product or, or the yeah. all round product. You know, we don't necessarily want to just go in that kind of hardcore direction. Um, right. And there's plenty doing that. And it's always yeah. interesting, you know, 12 years in is a long time for stand up and yet it isn't in the life of any sport. Yeah. So we're still very young and still figuring ourselves out. So I, I always think there are those people who got in so early who tend to be early adopters. Yep. And they want whatever's the newest and they always want that. So we're going to have this leading edge of people who are always pushing the envelope yeah. and always want to jump on whatever's the next thing. Yep. But that huge general population who are just enjoying it. And you mentioned from the very beginning, one of the re what you saw is that it's other people. So as much as it's this socially distanced, great activity to do solo, it is about community. That word yeah. comes up every single interview that I have, that it's about people then looking for that. But how, so how do we connect? So there's definitely 
um, groups and, and casual paddles and kind of events that aren't racing types that are, we're yeah. seeing more and more of. Well, um, we, we did a, we did an event called the Dragon World Championships where, and we so had this thing about maximize, what we call maximizing a material advantage. So what can we, what can we do that you maybe couldn't do with a composite board? And the fact is that we could make a four person race board that you could roll up, put in a bag, check on a plane and, and go to Barbados. So we did our first event in Barbados. We did, we did the second one uh, in Austria, the third one in France. Uh, this year we, had, we we didn't do one obviously, but um, is it coming back? Hopefully, yeah, I hope yeah, so. hopefully. And and so cool. um, four people on a racing board that that mm. takes you your point about race boards just to another level again. You know, it becomes a team sport. It comes a team. You know, we outrigger canoeing or um, rowing, for example. You know that you know those they work with teams. So I couldn't. I could say, well, why why does, why not get paddleboarding working with teams? So it's trying to find different ways to to deliver you know different experiences. I think is is important. Um, as much as it is trying to follow a performance mm -hmm. extreme sport. I still have that on my bucket list to go to one year finals. We held in Lake Tahoe an amazing one yeah. as part of the Tahoe Nalu for a yeah, couple yeah. of years. And it got yeah. quite competitive. You know, yeah, yeah. Carol of Quick Blade yeah. and uh, some top pros got on one and had a wonderful um, outrigger cadence. Uh, they yes. had all done outrigger. Yeah, and yeah. Wow, they could even turn well, which was amazing yeah, to yeah. me. That's usually the entertaining part is yeah. <laughs> turning the dragon around a buoy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so fun. you do have, yes. And, and I know, again, that 10, six rides, the, the core and your focus is on every man. But um, I love that you do have some very unique specialty mm -hmm. boards within your range. That, yeah. uh, it's it's going to be fun. Just, yeah, it is. It's, it's fun. Good fun. And that's why we made it. That's why we made inflatable race board because I just thought, could we make a race board that was fast? Right. Uh, and I, I just love the love that feeling when you overtake somebody on a on a carbon board or something, and they look at you and they say, "And they're like, oh, this is annoying." Uh, <laughs> but the person on the inflatable board is like, "This is fun." I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of you know mixing this up, and uh, same thing with with, the, with the, the dragon. It's just a fun thing to do, you know. It's the, yeah. Why not? Yeah. One thing that I've seen some of that I've wondered. Um, actually, the dragon is an example of it, but is the one design racing? Is mm. that you? I think having a set of 10, six rides would be a perfect, you know, so that, and again, it's, it's about the general group, but maybe um, the regional fun or local race event uh, might be a great gathering and more of a, you know, include more people, especially this next new wave, if there's boards available there. So there's just a yeah. set of boards that you could go race on and race against the same thing, yeah. same uh craft i also think as someone who as a seasoned racer it's super fun to race my friends on the same equipment instead of yes. on our individualized equipment to kind yeah. of you know level the playing field so, oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a we had a plan for the summer just gone if it didn't happen because of covid but we had this idea of doing ride outs and it was very much just for the people who already own our boards or ideally mm -hmm. but you know, anyone who's got a paddle would come along and we've in the uk for example we've got some and as you have in the us some amazing location with campgrounds and campsites right by the rivers and the waterways and just to have a kind of social aspect because that's what it is it's, it's that social thing and even if back mm -hmm. to the early days of windsurfing yeah they were, they were that social was around racing but it was just everyone gets together and just and talk sport you know talk talk kit and and talk experiences and and paddleboarding lends itself perfectly to that. So I'd love to do more of that this year, and we'd love to get that going uh, with the whole ride-out concept. That is and, fun. And, and, and I, I'm getting a lot of interest and requests. We've had some mm -hmm. panel talks on, like I mentioned, expeditions and travel. I think yeah. people are especially looking for that because they maybe they got started with an outdoor activity like stand-up paddling, yeah. but it was solo and a little bit more careful during this COVID pandemic. When it's over, I think people are really going to be looking for that kind of thing. Like where, how do I meet other people who do this? Where can yeah. I go and travel to? Um, so yeah. I think it will be continued success for you for sure. So um, ch some challenges and opportunities going forward. What's in the, in the stand up paddle world? What have you run into so far? Any predict? Um, I, I think the, the challenge is how, how you can get, can reach people. And um, you know, obviously there's a lot of products out there. There's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great product out there. There's also a lot of, not so great products and i think mm -hmm. we all as a as an industry and as kind of the most passionate people in the sport we, we kind of we need to make sure people are are, are doing it safely and i think that's the biggest the, mm -hmm. you can you can in the in the summer in the uk and, and obviously everywhere i'm sure you can pick up a board super cheap from the from the drugstore you know from from the gas station so in some locations <laughs> and i think that's uh that's great you know it's getting people into the sport but it 
it's so easy then just to pump it up or put it on the water and get yourself into some, some kind of difficulty, which obviously we don't want to people mm -hmm. to do. So right. I think us, uh, when I say us, I mean everyone on, on this live stream watching this uh, uh, and everyone in it who's already engaged in the sport has a responsibility to promote safety and not, not to the point where it's, you know, it's, it's kid glove stuff, but just make sure if you see someone going out is offshore winds or you're going out without a leash or the wrong type of leash, I think mm -hmm. we, really, we really need to look after the sport for, everybody, for everyone else and for the longevity of it. So I think that's a challenge. Uh, and I think we all kind of owe it to each other to make sure that happens. Um, you know, whether it's leash or weather conditions, I think that's, that's probably the biggest challenge ahead, I see, actually. And so, yeah. uh, as I said earlier, competition, brands, great, you know, bring it on. But, but let, let's just make sure we look after this for the, the future generations. Um, and, you know, it's very easy to get it banned somewhere because somebody does something silly or stupid. Uh, mm. And you know you'll get banned at a really lo great location. So I think we just need we just need to make sure we look after it. You know, we, yeah. But let's be the guardians of the sport. Um, so that's to me is the, the biggest challenge. Yeah, it is an interesting challenge. And I talking to people from all over the world. I, an interesting challenge just to tie in with that is here in the United States. They decided we were a vessel, and so mm. they categorize us in yeah. the boat category as a kayak. So our safety equipment's a little bit different. In, and so people absolutely freak out when they see pictures of people in the UK with a leash on, but no personal flotation device, yeah. because that's how they've been trained. And we have lots and lots of people who don't use leashes here, which yeah. I think is probably, you know, really now what, knowing what we know in most conditions is one of the more important pieces. Yes. Both, both yeah. are great pieces of safety equipment. If you're brand new, use them both. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. But it's funny that, there's a little bit of judgment going on around the world when people yeah. see something, the leg rope in Australia, yep. the leash, yep. the yep. Um, personal flotation device. Like, yep. what is that? Why are you wearing that? It's, it's the law here. Although yep. people don't even know then. But yes, it is this new group. And to your point about safety, I think we're getting lots of people who aren't com familiar with water. No. And that's huge because, yep. uh, you know, I live in a coastal town where we have drownings every year because they stand at the shore and there's a shore break. <laughs> and the, or they let their children, they just don't mm. understand the power of Mother Nature, no, no. those who haven't used the outside. And it's a wonderful yeah. thing in terms of health and well-being of our, you know, of humanity yes. to get people outside biking and hiking and camping and doing all these things. But they don't have the education and the safety no. education specifically needed. That's it. And, I, you know, you can put as many up as many signs and billboards up as you want. People suppose, won't read them. The best, the best is education from your fellow paddlers mm -hmm. and done obviously in the nicest possible way without, you know, aggression or, or, <laughs> or anger or something. But it's yes. just, you know, I love it actually when I see someone paddling down the river with their paddle back to front because and there was a smile on their face. Thinking, yeah, this is, this is the essence of this sport is that it's experience driven. You don't have to be the best technique. So right. you tell them, just turn your paddle around and it would just feel that much better. Yeah. And, and, then, and then it's a perfect opportunity to say, and you probably want to get yourself the right type of leash or the right type of PFD. But, uh, you know, yeah. I think that's, you know, it's important. So the brands, the, the brands that are involved in the sport need to be responsible and need to be communicating this. Uh, and the paddlers as a whole, the community needs to help, help along with that, with that road. It's, it's not a quick fix. We just need to get on yeah. with it, you know? So, yeah. Um, well, I think absolutely true. And that's why we encourage people to lessons and the education. But it yeah. is an interesting how to t the people who, again, they start with whatever they start with, but some are grabbing that at the gas station, as you said, piece of equipment without any knowledge and without any expert to tell them. So we love to see them get finding their specialty retailer or, or a brand or somebody where they can, or a forum even where they can ask questions yep. and or take, um, there's even some, I know in the UK, they just put out an online safety course. What, you know, if you can't get a lesson, what a great thing to be able to do to, to learn because they're, yes. There are important things that need to be known. And we, you know, in the industry are concerned about or hope that that person who got the piece of equipment without any knowledge yeah. has a positive, great experience because it should be a wonderful experience yes. right from the beginning. We want yeah. to make them lifelong paddlers, yeah. um, but sometimes translating that or getting that education and safety is, is a challenge. Right. But. And I think you, you, a good point that you made is, is the retailers and the, and the schools, they are so important to, to the longevity of the sport that, you know, that the, the promotion of good best practice, mm -hmm. uh, the world is online. We know that, you know, here, are, here we are talking on a, on a live stream, but you know, you can buy products online. That's great. And there's some really great online retailers uh, but there were some fantastic bricks and mortar at location of action, as we call it, retailers mm -hmm. 
who are doing a fantastic job spreading the, the good word and the safety message. So I, mean, I, just, I see there's a question there about sustainability yeah. as well. Yeah. And I, I think that's also, it, 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 yeah, that's right. That, that, that's important. And it's something that every, every company should be thinking about because mm -hmm. that's, that's also a responsibility. And eventually you're probably going to get to a point where if you haven't got a certain level of sustainability in your product model, then you, 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 know, you won't be allowed to sell the product. You know? So we, are, we work on that. Um, it's difficult because we're, we've got, we're mixing, uh, you know, natural materials with, uh, yeah. with man-made materials. And obviously we're all trying to, you know, the good brands are trying to find ways to help recover that, that, um, the waste for our factories yeah. are waste. So we don't have yeah. any, every Carbon waste, every, and, yeah, yeah it, we, it goes back into the, into manufacturing. Wonderful. Um, we're working with a great company at the moment, uh, looking at some sustainability on paddles, for example, um, trying to make paddles that can be recycled or even biodegradable to a point so there's some really exciting stuff coming mm. down the track for that um great and yeah I, we have a big thing about we call it dfd design for disassembly so everything we're trying to make everything that could be repairable you know i'm old enough to remember that you could repair your car if it broke down you know which probably modern yeah. cars you can't do so much but i would spend my teenage you know weekends fitting a new carburetor into my my, yep. my old trash was it car. at vw it was VW a VW, yeah yes, yeah and uh and it kind of and it kept it going you know and uh yeah. and, and so for example our pump everything on our pump you can replace every part you can replace you know and we try and do that we're, we're trying and treating right. that it's difficult to do with everything but we're, we're mm -hmm. really we're really focused on that and our design team are really into that you know they, they would love that to, to create a fully sustainable products. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, love hearing that. Yeah. Back to retailers for a second. You kind of mentioned what some of the, are there other things you've seen great retailers do? You mentioned that uh, the connection thing and that they, they are, you know. Well, I just think, you know, I'll go back to the windsurfing days when, um, when I worked, when I was in windsurfing, I worked in a windsurfing shop before I was a professional windsurfer. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things we ever did was that anyone, we sold any product to anybody, we'd show them how to use it even if it was just on the beach, how to rig it up, how to set it up, not just from a safety point of view, but also just because they're going to have a better time. And I, so I think retailers do a really good job. The good retailers do a great mm -hmm. job of showing people how, mm -hmm. you know, that's what you pay for is you're paying for that extra bit, that extra, that extra mile, extra bit of service. So I think, um, yeah, I think we, we, uh, we, we love our great retailers who do that. You know, the ones, the ones that just, no, I'm saying, okay, we haven't got any of these, but the ones that people come in and go, I want a paddleboard. Yeah, here you go. Here's the, give me the cash. Go see you later. Bye. That's not what, that's not what we're about. You know, we, we want retailers who can serve and, 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 and give good service. You know? Yeah. Fantastic. You are a true global brand. Like how many countries or continents are you on? I think I'm like 60, 60 markets. Wow. I think. So yeah, it's, <laughs> um, and again, grown, grown from, grown at that kind of grassroots level. So it's not, it's not an online direct sell to 60 markets. It's we've connected with somebody, in 60 markets and uh, uh, one of the six markets and, uh, and we're quite proud actually read that we've never once picked the phone up or sent an email to anybody prospecting to go would you like to sell our product uh I, when i started it it was just me really in a laptop and you know i didn't i, I was just trying to keep up with with, with everything that you have to do when you start a business a so it's always it's always <laughs> incoming requests mm -hmm. so out of all those all those uh people that we work with they've all come to us that said oh, i like what you're doing i'd like to get can i can I get involved? And obviously the answer is normally, yeah, great. Let's, let's work something out. And so now we've probably, we've got over 1500 retailers around the world selling our products, probably equally that again is with schools and, and higher lo locations. And I, I kind of proud, I'm fairly proud of the fact that we're probably as a brand supporting a whole load of people's income, you know, mortgage payments and all those sort of things, because they're part of our bigger, bigger, wider community. And I think something good about that. It's not, it's not just about that capitalist dollar, you know, you're not just trying to sell as much product to as many people as possible. You're trying to help develop something. So whether it's paddleboarding or completely different, different industry, it doesn't really matter. But uh, I think that, that that global spread for me is super yeah. important. You know? I think so, you have a true culture and, and community. Absolutely. That's grown. That's so neat to hear that it was that organic. Didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Um, in terms of breakdown by categories, you already said it's definitely that all around board. Is that like 60% or is that 80% of your Yeah, I'd say about, about 60 yeah, about sixty mm -hmm. percent, and then yeah, the touring will be the next, the next biggest, uh, and then we have a few sort of specialist areas. So being windsurfers, we have we do have a windsurf board on on the, in the range that you can to learn to windsurf on. So that that takes up a, a good chunk of the rest of it. Well, I'll let um, you know that has come up too because of this new wing. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not focused on it, your windsurfing board is a perfect stand-up paddle board for those who want to learn the yeah. wing, yeah. which is alternative to the windsurf. You know, yeah. no mast, but uh, yeah. it's popular right now. 
Yeah. And um, I think it's much more approachable than foiling. Sure. And yeah. you'll see pictures of people doing all of it. Again, those yeah. early people who are throwing it all together, but you can use a wing on a regular stand up pedal board if you know, and you can use it on one even with a fin, but if you yeah. have the center board, dagger board exactly. it makes all the difference in yeah, terms yeah. of slipping yeah. if you're a wind person. Yes. Yeah. No. Yep. So that that the our wind surfboards we call it, that works well for that as well. So yeah. But yeah, all round touring, probably in, all round touring uh then then sort of special stuff so the, the yoga stuff the the wind windsurf the racing uh white water kind of adds up the rest of it yeah great so any um any trends you're seeing you, i think we've kind of t hits on some of them for sure the direction of touring um mm -hmm. increasing um recreational any other trends going forward i love that you're working on sustainability within your company it's a challenge yes and yeah. thank you though for taking it on <laughs> Well, as we call, we call it, we call it, internally, we call it taking steps. You know, we, we, we accept that you can't make the giant leap in one day. You know, it takes, mm -hmm. takes time. So, yeah, other trends? No, I don't know. Really, I think that's just, uh, it's not a trend, but it's a, it's, a, it's a mission to try and just keep things going in the straight and narrow, not get too distracted by all the shiny stuff that's, that, you know, it will just distracts you. So we're, we're just trying to give great experiences to people. But, uh, yeah, I don't really, there's not really another trend I would say that are really, you know, we're busy. We're super busy. We're busy just connecting with as many people as possible and giving good experiences. Well, Matt, um, a challenge I would think of this COVID irregular year was that there was fear of things not coming in. Um, mm. Shipping is such an issue I'm hearing. Um, yeah. I mean, it's always been an issue with stand-up pedaling and with an inflatable, you've had a little less perhaps, but uh, that, um, yeah, there's the usual seasonality of this whole sport and all for you know, you and the retailers has really gotten woo, mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I think that's what I was saying earlier. The seasonality is, is flattened a bit, actually. We're seeing more people paddle through the winter. We're seeing increased demand in what we would have called the off season. Uh, but it's, it's continuing on, which is obviously great. And it's great. That's the hardest thing as a, as a manufacturer of products is, is it, it's massive peaks and troughs and everything. So trying to keep that consistency going. You know, we're lucky, you know, we're big enough that we can just, we keep producing all the time. So we're not, we, we don't have those, we don't have this piece and trot anymore, but uh, it, from a retailer stocking point of view, that's always quite difficult, I think, for those guys yeah. to know what to start when. Do you have your own factory or you produce? Yeah, yeah. we run, our, it's a private facility that we run, that yeah. only makes our products. And, you know, again, that's another benefit for us. You know, we can A big benefit that. and very unusual yeah. in, in the stand yeah. pedal world. There's a lot yeah. made in the same factories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Gives uh, you more control. Yeah, and you, know, you, you a bit more master of your own destiny um also also it's always your fault if it goes wrong <laughs> you know good and bad <laughs> <laughs> the good and bad both mm. sides of the coin with all of it yeah well wonderful john what great stories you have about you and the company that um congratulations on what you've built in 12 years does it feel well, like a whole lifetime <laughs> it does and it's and, and i always say this it's not it's not a one-man thing okay it was through you know from the start bit then you know sort of Bit, then you know, sort of the three of us that started it really but now i have such we have such a fantastic team in the red office you know uh, mostly working remotely at the moment but uh, you know 30 i think it's 33 actually i was counting up today going how many people is it uh, it's, it's 30 33 people and then the wider community as well uh, it's a team effort really is a global team effort you know we've got we, we have a team in australia that that, that does things that we that we directly involved with uh, rather than being a third party wholesaler um uh, and yeah i i'm really thankful for everybody just getting involved and and, and growing building into what it is you know red is not is not just me you know far from it these days um so it, yeah it's, it's fantastic to see that and see the people so passionate behind it well that's very generous and humble of you to share it but uh, thank you for taking the time because you are you know the to me the you know brand and head of the brand and co-founder and ceo so um Give, give still yourself still a crap paddle back. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to do that. Right? <laughs> well, John, stay, stay healthy and happy. I hope it's a, again, end of a very unusual year, but you know, we're finding good things in it too. <laughs> yep. Now there's Hopefully loads of positives. We get, get through it all soon and um, be back together in 2021 yeah. traveling and seeing each other in different places, but um, really un fantastic uh, to hear everything about red and about you. And, um, if you do have any links you want me to share, again, there's a Facebook group, you guys who are listening, um, and this is recorded, so you can send people who didn't get a chance to hear. Um, you're welcome, Mel. Mel's thanking us both.
Mel's from Thanks, Mel. Alaska. <laughs> ah, awesome. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, well uh, as I say, thank you very much for everyone tuning in. And, and yeah, Kristen and the, and the SubConnect team, uh, thanks for giving us a chance to, to talk. You know, it's always, we, we work, we, everyone works so hard in the industry. You know, we head down, we're working, and sometimes it's just nice to stop and, and do this. You know, this is like it a is. coffee break, isn't it? So it is fun. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank <laughs> That's you very what we much. could call it the coffee break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care and be thanks. well. And thank you, everyone who's listening. Appreciate you being here. Take thanks, care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.